we're going to close out our series on sowing seeds of success. Over the last month at our morning services, we've been focusing on what are the attributes, the qualities, the characteristics that we need to demonstrate and deploy in our lives so that we can be effective as disciples and disciple makers. Amen? Amen. And so we're closing that out today with the title, Getting More of God. Does anybody in the house of the Lord want more of God? Yes. Amen. Faith is the currency of the kingdom. And I believe that we're living in times and spaces where I believe God wants to totally turn around the way that we live our lives. I believe he's calling us to live supernatural lives for him rather than us succumbing to the natural realm and all its obvious limitations. Because we are men and women of God. We are called to live by faith and faith alone. The word of God is clear. My kingdom is not of this world. And yet if we're really honest in our Christian walk, isn't it sometimes easier to live by sight and not by faith? It requires less effort, less enthusiasm, less energy, less focus, and less attention. But it damages and dilutes the life that God has prepared for us. Because we're in the house of the Lord, amen? amen. So we're Pentecostals, yes. Bible-believing, Spirit-filled, yes. tongue-talking Christians and Pentecostals that are filled with the Holy Ghost. We all know the story in Acts 2 very well. The Holy Spirit fell. You receive power from on high. And God has a greater purpose for our lives on earth than merely operating in the natural realm. We are called to live in a post-Pentecost world, not a pre-Pentecost world. Nudge your neighbor and tell them that this morning. We are called to live in a post-Pentecost world, not a pre-Pentecost world world. And you know, the more you open your heart and mind to all that the Holy Spirit has prepared for you, you'll get downloads, deeper revelation, fresh anointing, increased wisdom, sharper discernment on how you can live your life as a Christian. And the Holy Spirit is both available and accessible to us. His dreams have got to become our dreams. Amen. We've got to partner with the Holy Spirit, not the other way around. And so my heart and my desire this afternoon is that the supernatural becomes both natural and normal in your life. The Word of God declares that signs, wonders, and miracles follow all those who believe. And we've got to break out of the limitations that can sometimes arise in our hearts. Because whether we like it or not, the days ahead are challenging. The days ahead are going to demand us to shake the natural order of things by faith. Hebrews 10 verse 35 simply declares, do not throw away your confidence because it will be richly rewarded. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 11. It's like the NFL equivalent of the Hall of Fame of the champions of the faith in the Scriptures. I encourage you, open your Bible at some point this week and just read Hebrews 11. If that doesn't instill some hope and courage and confidence in you, I don't know what will. But I know today God wants to open our hearts and minds to the heavenly realm. In the chaos and the confusion of what's becoming a very complicated and cluttered world, I'm convinced beyond doubt God wants to give us more and more of himself. Amen? We all know 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. However... It is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human mind has conceived the things that God has prepared for them. And we would all say, Amen. But context is crucial. Verse 10, the very next verse, captures how we as Christians can walk in that. These are the things, verse 10 declares, that God has revealed to us by the Spirit. So we need to be men and women of the Spirit, amen? So if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles with me to 2 Kings 4, and it's verses 1 to 7. Let's unpack this story together this morning. 2 Kings 4, verses 1 to 7. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditors is coming to take my boys as slaves. 
Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Do not ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him, shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. He replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. I want to take some time today to maybe draw some parallels between this widow and maybe our lives today. She's lost almost everything. Her husband, godly man, has died. All her earthly possessions, gone. There was no food, no money, no way of supporting herself or her sons. And in that season, women were not allowed to work. So her outlook was bleak and barren. Her resources completely exhausted. Nothing in the house of any note or merit. She no doubt would have had her husband's creditors knocking on the door, demanding the payment. She probably went days without food. She probably had sleepless nights. She probably allowed her faith to erode in light of her plight and her problem. What do we think the condition of our heart would have been? I would have thought worry, fear, an expectation for the worst possible outcome, the removal of her sons to clear the debt. Her entire world is collapsing before her very eyes. Maybe this morning you're in that position. And I want to take us to the first point in my message today. She did the right thing. Bring yourself to God afresh. There's no evidence in this story that this woman goes anywhere else. She takes her issues to the right person, God. Now, Elisha was a prophet of God and would have been God's representative to her in that time. But it forces a question for us this morning. When life is collapsing before our eyes, is God the first port of call? Or do we attempt to redeem and resolve our issues via other platforms and methods first before we eventually bring ourselves to God? Because, you know, there's a beautiful promise in this story when we go directly and exclusively to God with our issues, the first words that Elisha says to her, how can I help you? Church, this morning, I believe that that's what God would say to you with your problem, your issue, your challenge. If you present yourself to him, I anticipate his first question back to you is, how can I help you? That question to her proved beyond doubt that she had made the right decision. She not only went to the only person who could help, but she went to the one who had the capacity and the capability of helping her. That question would have started to soothe her fears, maybe allowed fresh hope to stir in her heart. You know, as people, when we see people in evident and obvious need, our natural inclination is that we want to help, but sometimes our heart rules our mind. We don't have the resources. We don't have the scope. We don't have the time. We don't have the capacity to help that person. But can I tell you, KT, this morning, God is limitless in his capacity to supply your needs. He is limitless in his time and his resources to help you where you are. Will you go to him first today? That is our question. Because the widow replied to Elisha, your servant has nothing How many times do we do that in our Christian walk? The little that we have, maybe money, maybe resource, finance, time, talent. How many times in our lives do we say, oh, I have nothing? Do you know what God can do with nothing? He can do lots with that. But then she took a moment, and it's almost an afterthought. She said, oh, hang on, I've got a little jar of olive oil. She mentioned it, I anticipate, just to be transparent about her plight and her problem. But she had dismissed the little that she had out of hand. She deemed it insufficient. And because it was insufficient, she decided that it was incapable of contributing to her breakthrough. I anticipate we're like that with God sometimes, huh? 
We have a little bit of something, maybe a little bit of faith, and we think that it's inadequate. But God will always work with what he's already given you. And he will use your abilities, your talents, your possessions to bless you. Because we serve a God of multiplication. He's looking for availability ahead of ability. Are you ready? Are you willing for God to use the little that you have for his glory? Because we know the God of, word of God well. And littered through the scripture is story after story of what God can do with a little. Maybe today your faith is failing. It's fragile and you feel that God has let you down. Can I encourage you, don't stop believing. Faith the size of a mustard seed. That's all that we need to put our trust where our trust has been earned. And I'm convinced that we are close to seeing what God can do with what you label nothing. To God, it is something. It is sufficient, and therefore it is totally capable of transforming your life Would you believe it, KT, this morning? Would you believe that God is totally capable of transforming your life with the little that you bring to him? We all know the phrase, it's well worn in the Christian circles. When God is, when you are down to nothing, God is up to something. She didn't realize what she had in that little jar. She underrated it. She overlooked it. She thought it was feeble feeble and fragile. And yet God would use that exact thing to demonstrate his power. And for us as Christians, because we're Pentecostals, we cannot ignore or overlook or undervalue the power and the potential of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Do you know, Elisha gave the woman some pretty explicit instructions. We don't always like to admit it, right? But God always knows best for our lives if we are willing to walk in obedience. He tells her, go around, ask for all your neighbors, for all jars. Don't just ask for a few. And it would appear to me that Elisha was building into his plan for her life her potential lack of faith or trust. Do not ask for just a few. It's an unnecessary point, but I think it reflects our own hearts sometimes. Don't we sometimes feel that when we think God might work in a scenario, there's a little bit of us that holds back because we're a little bit unsure, we've been disappointed before, we've been seemingly let down before, that we don't give ourselves fully to what God can do. That's why I believe he said to her, don't just get a few. And then she's got to go to the neighbors. Oh boy, nosy neighbors. One or two of us might have them in our homes (laughs) where we live. Surely those neighbors would be asking the question, what is she asking all these jars for? What is she going to do with them? And he, was, she, she, he told her, ask all the neighbors. He wanted to maximize the scope and the scale of her victory and breakthrough. But she had to move past a few emotions. Shame, guilt, questioning, embarrassment, fear. I would imagine it would have been a cocktail of emotions as she knocked on the first door and said, uh, excuse me, can I have some vessels? Can I borrow some jars? She was not sure what the response would be, but she knew she had to be obedient, which leads me to my second point. We must walk in immediate obedience to God. Amen? She was clearly a woman destitute and desperate for a miracle, and she accepted and acknowledged her need. She did precisely what Elijah told her to do. And it seems to me that there's only one condition around the vessels. They had to be empty. We get no visibility on the number of vessels, the shape of them, the size of them. Did they have a handle? Did they have a cap on them? They just had to be empty. Seemingly, that was the only requirement. And the learning point for us today is whether we like it or not, whether we accept it or not, God wants to use what we already have. Because God wants to turn it around for your good. He wants to make good everything that's problematic in your life. But you know, God can only work with an empty vessel. Said differently, if we don't empty ourselves of ourselves, there will be no breakthrough. There will be no victory. There will be no miracle. There will be no provision. And the word then reads, go inside your house, close the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it aside. See, she was given three bullet point instructions. Shut the door, pour the oil, fill the vessels. Now, in my mind, 
She's been told to go publicly to go and ask for the vessels. I'm thinking, God, you're going to want to demonstrate this miracle publicly. That would be logical, reasonable, and rational in my mind. But sometimes God's instructions don't make sense, huh? Anyone, anyone in the house of the Lord ever been told to do something by God and you're like, hmm, not sure this one makes sense, Lord. And we give feedback. Is it just me? Any Christians honest in the house today? We like to give God feedback. We like to appraise his instructions to us because we're not sure that that's really compatible with where we're at. There's a, a line in the song by Hillsong called New Wine. The song is called New Wine. And it says, when I trust you, I don't need to understand. Boy, that'll take a minute. We sing it really well. But I wonder if there's a little bit of a gap between what we sing and what we live out. For God to be the miracle worker in our lives, we need to relinquish knowing the outcome. We need to give up our right of control, dictating, defining the outcome, seeing beyond the next step. But the immediacy of her obedience is crucial. This is a woman desperate for answers, a way out, a breakthrough. She would have done almost anything to pay off the debt so that her sons would not have been sold. And my question for you today is, are you prepared to get desperate for God, for your situation, for your circumstance? It's also worth noting that she made no attempt to negotiate with God. There is nothing in that scripture where she starts to disagree with him. She wants to start dissecting or the, the instructions start debating with him. She just immediate obedience. And there is something so profound for us today in walking in obedience. She recognized that her obedience was linked to her breakthrough. And I want to suggest to you that the immediacy of your obedience will provide the platform for your breakthrough as well. Are there any parents in the house today? Yes. Wow, there were some strong yeses and amens. <laughs> Got a little word for you here. I'm sure that there are some parents in the house that wish that their children would do exactly what they say when you ask them to do something. Amen? Amen. And before you start laughing, you're a child of God too, and I sit there and I think, there's probably times where God is saying the same thing to you. You're a child of God. He's telling you to do something, and you're not being obedient. The same God who honored his word to this widow will honor his word to you. Amen. Her hope starts to enlarge. Her confidence is growing. Her faith is being fueled because she starts to see the early stages of her miracle. So she goes home, closes the door with her and her sons. She shuts herself in with God, away from the noises, away from the distractions. Do we do this when God speaks to us? Or is God's voice just one of many that we look to for guidance and direction? Because my third point is crucial. If you want to see a breakthrough, you have to position yourself for your miracle. Consider the fluctuating emotions and feelings that must have been going through her heart and her mind. Her faith is at best tenuous. It's tentative. It's mixed with apprehension that maybe if this doesn't work, it's over for her. Creditors knocking on the door Monday morning. But there's something stirring. Now I want you to imagine being closed away with God. You've got a stack of jars that are empty and you just pick the first one up. Your hand's shaking. You're not sure. But the oil starts to pour. Her miracle is here. Amen. Your miracle is here, KT. God is going to do something substantial and significant in your life. Amen. Are you prepared to go to God first? Are you prepared to be obedient? Are you prepared to position yourself for your miracle? I think her eyes would have been the size of dinner plates. She would have just been like, whoa, mind blown. God has done exactly what he said he would do. If you want to see your miracle, you've got to walk in that obedience. Her faith would have grown. Her confidence would have grown. Every jar that she starts to fill, her faith is growing. You could almost put her name in pencil in Hebrews 11 at this point. But then in the back of her mind, she's thinking, when does it stop? That must be there. It's not stated. 
but I would suggest that it's implied. But her faithfulness to presenting herself afresh to God, coupled with her obedience, kept the oil flowing. She only did three things, closed the door, poured the oil, filled the vases, uh, vessels. We get no confirmed number. She got hold of every jar that was possible. The oil only stopped because she ran out of jars. No other reason. Learning outcome for us. Every day that we don't consecrate ourselves to God and ask him for more, we're going to run dry. The oil's going to stop. And instead of walking in the anointing that God has given us, we start to walk from ministry from memory. We start to work from intellect and information instead of revelation and discernment. No more oil. No other answer. It begs the question for us today, how do we avoid that pitfall? How do you maintain your desire and your determination for God? We've got to unlock the spiritual principles that guarantee that the oil continues to flow in our lives. Amen? Amen. But here's the reality. Like this widow, you've got to get desperate for God. You've got to be able to pursue God. Total obedience to his instructions, particularly when it's not comfortable or convenient. You need to shut yourself away from all the noise, all the distractions, all the divisions, all the depression out there in the world and get alone with God. There's a recording of Israel Houghton on his song, Alpha and Omega. It's a song we know well. In one of the live recordings, I believe it was in South Africa, the song, he starts the song with an extra line. It's not in the actual song. And it simply says, away, away, away from the noise, alone with you. And I believe there's incredible power and potential in our lives in being alone with God. And those jars would have been made of clay. They represent you and I in the house of the Lord this morning. And God has only one objective. He wants to fill you up. He wants to refresh you, but you must be empty. The responsibility sits with us today to decide that we are going to determine to lay down self-sufficiency, self-effort, any crutch of dependence on things or people in this world. Verses 6 and 7 read, When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring another. He said, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil, pay your debts. You and your son live on what is left. Lift your hand with me in the house of the Lord. We serve a God of overflow. Amen? Amen. We serve a God that wants to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that you can possibly imagine if you are just willing and ready to receive him afresh in your life. That's all that is needed and necessary for you to walk in favor. She has enough debt, enough money to clear her debt and live on the overflow. This story proves to us that we have a limitless supply of God. She ran out of oil because she ran out of jars, period. You and you alone determine how much of God that you want. You know, it's a well-established fact in the kingdom. We know the kingdom principle. What you sow is what you reap. So you can have as much or as little of God as you desire. The choice is yours. I can't preach a sermon that doesn't have a proverb in. Proverbs 11.25 declares, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Can I encourage you, KT, this morning, whilst you wait for your breakthrough, whilst you wait to get more of God, keep sowing and serving into the lives of the people around you. God is going to perform a miracle in your life. Victory, increase, freedom, breakthrough, it is all yours in the name of Jesus. And I can guarantee you, from personal experience, if you keep sowing and serving into others, you keep bringing yourself to God, the oil is going to keep flowing because it's flowing from the one true anointed one. Amen. The greatest psalm, or the most popular psalm, probably the greatest as well, is Psalm 23. We probably know it by heart. And David says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over or my cup overflows, depending on your translation. That is your portion. 
And so in conclusion, bring yourself afresh to God. Walk in immediate obedience. Position yourself for a miracle. Because Psalm 13, verses 5 and 6 confirm it. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Let you in on a little secret before I close. I love going to America. I have been many, many times. And one of the most beautiful things about going to America is when you go to the fast food restaurants, or any restaurant, frankly, they give you a cup, and you get free refills. I love sweet iced tea. So whenever I'm in the South, sweet iced tea. But you know the beauty of that is you can consume as much of that as you want. You decide. And it's the same with God. You get to decide. There is a bottomless, limitless supply of God and his oil for your life. The question is, are you thirsty for it? Do you want it? Is it for your life? Because you know, faith is never the result of striving. It can't be manufactured. You can't make it up with self-effort and energy. Faith always involves total surrender. It comes from your heart, not your mind. But as you renew your mind, you'll enhance your faith, you'll deepen your faith, and that faith will fuel you with fresh understanding, divine revelation. Because whether we like it or not, we can never avoid God's ways of maturing us. In your life today, where do you need God to move? Where do you need the oil of God to move and flow? Because your hunger for God will never exceed your own humility. Because every time you have humility, that recognizes personal need, just like this widow. But also, you have to recognize that if you think you can do it yourself, how are you getting on with that? You will never find freedom from the things you make excuses for. You've got to decide today, I'm going to get desperate for God. Desperate for God. And I'm convinced, like this widow, we will see breakthrough. Decide decisively today to bring yourself afresh to God, to walk in immediate obedience to what he tells you to, even if you don't understand, and position yourself for a miracle. Trust me, God will turn it around for your good. Amen? Just like he did for that widow, you will serve and enjoy an overflow of God. Does anybody want more of God in the house of the Lord? Is anyone desperate for God? Does anyone need to be filled up today?